Shane Sege, and joining me today is Pat Scrimger, Director of Transit Customer Systems and Planning. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Shane. Good to be here. At the last Transit Commission, the 2021 business plan was uh, presented, and one of those items was uh, improvements to real-time transit information. Uh, specifically, it was mentioned that stations would be receiving displays outside the station to inform customers of uh, you know next train and service status. Can you explain a little bit about what these displays will uh, look like, where they'll be located, what information will be presenting? Sure. So if you're familiar with uh, the the LCD video screens that we have at a lot of transitway stations now and O train stations, so there's the you know the big one on the uh, on the mezzanine level at Tiny's Pasture that shows when the next buses are coming. It'll be a smaller version of that. It's still a very big screen by by home standards, but it's you know it's basically an LCD screen and a ruggedized case to protect it from winter weather, and um, they'll be mounted right at the entrance to the stations. Um, either on the glass, on the wall, in front of the glass, but at a, at a convenient place. Uh, the first ones that we're working on right now are two of them at Rideau Station, and that will give us a bit of, um, you know, experience. You get, make sure they work, make sure they, uh, you know, they work as they're supposed to, that they're given the information they're supposed to, and then after that we'll start rolling them out to other, other stations across the line. So I think if you go to Rideau Station right now, some of the footings are in for it already. I'm not 100% positive, but um, at the east the east entrance to Rideau Station is really likely where the first one's going to go in, and that should be in the next next little while. When they're on default mode, they'll show basic information like what time's the first train, what time's the last train, basic information about the line. If there's ever a time when service is running slowly or there's uh, modified conditions like for single tracking we might have to say everyone board from one platform in the rare case that the trains aren't running and we've got replacement buses running the sign would say where to go to catch a replacement bus and then when we get uh, you know it'll show schedule information but then when we get uh, the real-time data feed for the trains we'll be able to say next train down at the platform in x minutes uh, so people can gauge, you know, especially evenings and things like that, when the trains are running every 15 minutes, they can go, oh, should I, should I take the elevator or should I walk down the stairs? So those are coming soon, and uh, we're looking forward to having another, you know, just another medium we can use to give real-time information to customers. These will be predominantly outside of the station entrance or just as you pass inside? The... It, they'll be where they can fit at each station, but we're aiming for outside or sort of, you know, on the on the glass. Like the, the downtown stations where we're right against the sidewalk, there might not be space, but it's it's to be facing outside. It's like a, you know, we've got the vinyl signs there now that say things like first, you know, when does the station open? When does the first train come? Uh, but this will give us something dynamic that we can use to, you know, redirect people if we have to or give them the information that's uh, relevant to them at that moment. You know, you'd want to, when you're getting close to uh, the last train, you want to provide that information in bigger letters than just having someone look for it on a vinyl sticker. And just specifically about the Rideau Center station, will we see them inside the Rideau Center? Like near the elevator, near uh, Shoppers Drug Mart? It's an interesting idea. We, we haven't uh, got that far with this project yet. And so right now we're looking at putting them on station buildings and on city property, but Later on, there's the possibility to get them into private space if it all works out well. And moving on with the, the real-time, do you have an idea when we will expect to see the real-time uh, location data and arrival times for the trains um, through your app and the API? Yeah, we don't yet. We uh, it's, it's still a, a deliverable that's due from RTG, um, and they've been concentrating obviously for the last year and a bit on much more important things, the, you know, basic uh, reliable operation of the train and durability and winter weather and things like that and responding to some of the other issues that have come up. So um, so while we continue to press them to deliver it, it's not the thing we press them on the hardest. Okay, but that's still something that's expected, which oh, is yes, good to hear. Sure. And uh, lastly, on the real-time information, is one of the end goals... Um, to support GTFS RT, 
and that gives a trip update service alerts in addition to vehicle position. Is that something that OC is working towards? We're thinking about it. There's, uh, you know, there's different ways that the industry is going uh, in transit and um, and ours are, you know, we're publishing things through our own API right now. Um, so we haven't been um, looking at GTFS RT, but um, we haven't, we've been looking at it. We just haven't been using it. So it's, it's something we're thinking about this year. Um, as I've mentioned at the Transit Commission, we're, we're looking at all of our automated information, the, the, the app, the API, all the things. So we've got, we've got better data coming into it than, um, than we had years ago when we set those things up. Um, so if we can use that better, those better data that are coming in to push better data out to the API subscribers, then uh, that's a possibility. But we just haven't, we haven't got that far yet. Now, another thing that's uh, been in progress is the fare gates uh, work towards getting them to accept uh, credit card payments, mobile phone uh, payments. Um, right now, the Rito Center has, or the Rito Station has one fare gate that's piloting this new system, but that is hoped to be expanded to all stations, all fare gates and the buses. Can you tell us a little bit about how this works? To start with, you know, it's one fare gate with one smart card reader on it at one location. Um, that's letting our vendor work out, you know, they worked out the programming of the, of the smart card reader, how it fits into their system. Um, they're still working with the, the financial I don't know what you call it, the financial back end supplier. Everything has to go to a financial clearinghouse before it's uh, before the amounts are settled with the individual banks. Um, so that that data flow is up and running, but still they're still working on making it making it exactly right and getting it to do everything they want. So we did that as a you know this is a time to. Uh, get feedback from customers. Some customers got a hold of us when they tapped and it didn't work as expected, so they tell us about it, and and we have the supplier look into it. Um, so right now, most of that work is not visible to customers, but um, once it does work, then we'll proceed with uh, replacing all the smart card readers. The ones from uh, two years ago are unfortunately already out of date when it comes to financial security. So the new ones are, you know, you remember the old ones were that, that gray rectangle. The new ones are a green circle and they'll be mounted in pretty much the same place on each of the fare gates. And, um, they can receive, um, credit card, debit card data. We still have to work out the relationship with debit cards. That's another piece of work that's going on this year. Um, then what that ties in with is uh, we're replacing all of the smart card readers on all the buses because they are, um, you know, the technology changes so fast. They're at uh, end of life, maybe not end of life physically, but end of life for what's encoded in them. So we've got new ones coming on the buses that uh, will do everything the current ones can do, plus they'll accept credit and debit cards, plus they'll have a barcode reader on them so we can scan tickets and scan uh, tickets people going to football games uh, anything else that we can do is sort of a light uh, ticket when we just um, print a barcode which obviously can be a cheaper fair medium to produce than uh, than a smart card so then you know we'll move on to get that fundamentally bedded down and working and then we can move along to um, to other things um, we're looking at uh, possible daily and weekly fare caps so that you don't pay more than the price or, uh, of a set amount each day or uh, you don't pay more than a set amount each week or each month. And that might give some um, possibilities for people who are uh, less frequent users. Um, how we get into discounted fares really is going to be it's going to depend we'll we'll see it would mean setting up a registration system so that people would have to register that this card is valid for this discount and people would have to bring another way of proving that they're eligible for that discount um that m might be possible but it might be just more onerous than um 
then we want to put that much burden on our customers. So we might just say the best way to get a discount is is with a Presto card. So uh, it's it's not an easy and obvious thing to do, but it's certainly something we want to check into. Well, it's definitely great to hear that that's uh, progressing and uh, especially with COVID and trying to reduce physical contact, it's a great option to uh, be advancing in, in the transit world. Um, and lastly, on the, the fares, I wanted to touch on um, uh, OC Transpo Presto and the STO MultiCard. If someone has a, a monthly pass on either system, they can board and start their trip on the opposing system. But if they have money only on the e-wallet, that's not possible. I'm sure that there's plenty of reasons why that's the case. Is that always going to be the case, or do you think that's something that could be resolved? Well, it's uh, it goes back to a pretty fundamental policy decision that um, people who, to make sure that uh, no one's gaming the system and picking up whichever fare happens to be cheaper at that at that month or that year. So that, excuse me a sec, I'll just put this guy safely over here. Um, the principle is, and has always been, that if you live in Ontario, Ottawa or surroundings, you buy an OC Transpo Pass. If you live in Quebec, Gatineau or surroundings, you buy an STO monthly pass. We carried that over um, when we went to Smart Cards. Um, the second part, if you're paying a single ride fare, the the policy direction is you pay the fare on the bus that you start your trip or the bus or the train where you start your trip for the first time. So if you're uh, paying cash fare or in the old days, if you were using tickets, you would drop an OC Transpo ticket or an OC Transpo cash fare into the fare box on the bus and take a transfer if you're going to Gatineau. If you're starting your trip in Gatineau, um, you start with an STO fare. So we've continued that on um, uh, in the smart card world. The two smart card systems don't work. They're not the same technology behind the tap. They're the same, you know, they're both NFC cards, but they come from different suppliers. They're coded differently. And so there's not a lot of, um, there's not a, a complete feedback loop. What, what it can do is it can check that the card is valid. Uh, because that was what was needed when the the fares were introduced. So um, our card readers hold a list of every number that's valid and every number that's been turned off by a customer, or, you know, if, if a uh, if value is down to zero. So we can, with the Presto cards, we can read from the card and see that it's valid. We can write to the card and say, oh, they've taken a trip. It's a transfer. Here's the time they started the trip. And then that that 90 minute or 105 minute clock, depending on time of day, is starts because it's written onto the card. And when they get onto subsequent buses, we can say, oh yeah, it's still valid. The what we can't do from our card readers is write to an STO smart card. And what the STO can't do with theirs is write to a Presto card. Um, so we can read that there's a valid transfer from an STO bus. We can read that there's a valid monthly pass. They can read that there's a valid um, monthly pass or valid transfer written on. But if you go to tap your Presto card on an STO bus to start a trip, there's nothing for it to read. So it just says you got to pay an STO fare. So that's, that's where we are. Now, the the systems are evolving. There's a lot of work that Metrolinx down in Toronto is doing to move what's called a card-based system to an account-based system so that the the card, instead of being a, a read-write smart card, is much more of a um, token of your identity. And, and that requires us to have very fast communication from the point of sale back to the central system to check things like how much value is left on this card. That may give us some new directions. At the same time that we're going to accept uh, credit cards and eventually debit cards, the STO is doing the same on their buses. So that's another option for people. Um, you know, you can start your trip in Ottawa and tap your, your credit card, pay an OC Transpo fare. When you're coming back in the afternoon, you could start your trip on an STO bus, pay an STO fare with your credit card. And you'd see them as two separate um, charges, but, um, but that's something that might work you know there's a lot of 
back end checking to make sure that this happens. If somebody taps a credit card on an STO bus, there's nothing being written to the, the credit card. Uh, so you tap it again on an OC Transpo bus or at a at an O train station, and it would right now it would just charge another fare. Um, so that for the moment we will tell people if you're making a multi agency trip, you're best to do it with either a multi card or a Presto card. Station improvements. So we had an update again at the Transit Commission that. Uh, uh, new improvements are being uh, worked on for Blair and Tunney's Pasture to further enhance the temporary canopies. In the past, it had been announced and, and discussed that there was the possibility of putting more of a permanent canopy or a cantilevered um, uh, covering. Are those still, is, is that what's being referred to at this point? That's what we're working on. Um, you know, at Blair Station, you know, you're on the south side, you're back against that concrete wall. And we found early on, um, you know, we've moved some bus stops around to reduce crowding, but customers who travel through Blair Station uh, know that the the shelters that are there were in the early years when ridership or early months when ridership was so high. Um, the shelters that are there are both an amenity because you can get out of the wind and get out of the rain, but they're also an obstacle when um when things get busier and when people are just moving, moving down that platform. So uh, what we're, we're looking at is a, it might, it, it's going to look like a cantilever, whether it is a cantilever or not, it'll, it'll cantilever out from something, it, you know, whether it's bolted onto the back wall or whether there's posts, but, you know, to come out like this more so that there's places to stand out of, out of, uh, out of the way, out of the rain, but there's more space for people to walk along the platform. So we've got some, you know, we got some early concepts back from manufacturers and contractors and um, you know, sort of working on exactly how's that going to work and, and get that moving. So the idea there is that that would go on the south platform at Blair Station, south bus platform, <clears throat> excuse me, because that's the platform that'll still be in heavy use uh, after the extension out to trim opens. And at Tunney's Pasture, we're looking at the, uh, putting that permanent thing on the, on the south side at Tunney's, the Canada side, uh, because that's the platform that will still be there very, very long term after, um, after the line's extended west. So on the north side at Tunney's, we would keep the, the temporary for, you know, we're down to, we're down to a countable number of winters left before, um, before that line gets extended west. And the other thing at Blair is the, uh, the old elevator over on the north side. The old elevator dates back to transitway days, and it's been, um, you know, it's less reliable than we'd want. And also it's a single elevator. It's small. Um, it's got no backup you know, for those times it goes down. It hasn't been going down so much recently, which is nice. Um, but when it does go down, we send a bus out there just to shuttle people from the north side to the south side. So when we replace that, we'll put in a new elevator, but we'll do like we have at all the other uh, stations on line one and put in a pair of elevators so that if one's down, the other one's there. And just furthering on this, uh, for Herdman, it also has a temporary uh, uh, scaffolding and, and shelter that's been installed. Is there any chance of a permanent structure replacing that at some point in the future? We're still thinking about it. Uh, we're still working on what's possible. We have reduced our capital spending a lot to um, during COVID to um, make sure that the city's got more resources to respond to COVID. Um, when when we're back into whatever we call the the future times, when we're back into a a time when finances are are normal again, we'll start looking at you know how do we do? Is it time to um, bring our capital spending back up to where it used to be. So right now we're not working on that, but um, it's a, it remains a possibility. It's it just seems to be uh, you know equally beneficial, but probably less crucial there than it is at uh, at Blair. Moving on now to uh, the rollout of the retail at the different stations. So line one, stage one has retail uh, opening up at Blair, Herdman, Rideau, and Tunney's Pasture uh, in the form of Happy Goat Coffee, local coffee shop. 
And it was announced as well that uh, for Stage 2, Plastorlines, Algonquin, Lincoln Fields, Trim and Bayshore will have uh, retail. You know, a, a proponent hasn't been found or hasn't been uh, moved on yet at this point. But further to that, do you anticipate the possibility in the future of uh, pop-up retail being possible at some of the stations? Because it is kind of ironic that, um, uh, you know, Parliament Station and Lion Station, w which are two equally busy stations, especially Parliament, don't have any retail presence or coffee shop or quickie or anything right in them. So do you ever see additional stations coming on board with that or pop up so we've yeah yes if if the demand is there if uh if there's a you know if a company wants to come in or a, any merchant wants to come in and make us a proposal there's lots and lots of scope we've got um you know we've got those fixed spaces which were designed that way which have got electricity and plumbing and um comms we've got other spots along the walls you know the the open space at the East End of Parliament, for instance. Um, there's um, there's other spots where there's a you know there's a spot up against a wall or a spot in the middle that isn't in the main passenger flow where we do have um, some electricity available, um, and that that option is always open. We went out to um, when we first went out to market advertising, pro, you know, asking for proposals on retail space. We put out lots of ideas like uh, um, you know, pop-up or um, flat, you know, display phone-based retail up against a wall. Um, the response we got back from the commercial businesses was they're interested in renting space and setting up a business. So we, that's the leasing call that we went ahead with that, um, that Happy Goat uh, took. Um, so those other possibilities are there. I don't think too many companies are going to want to do it right now, but, um, you know, because it can be pretty quiet in those stations outside, well, any time of the day right now with uh, with COVID where it is. Uh, but as time goes on, as the, um, you know, employment downtown comes back, as the uh, city gets, gets its economic feet back under it, um, and as more and more people use use the train i think uh, we're we're ready to respond to um you know commercial proposals that might come in i also want to talk briefly about uh, the advertising up to date we haven't seen any advertising in the stations or the trains unlike the buses and the bus shelters and the stations um for advertising how would you see it what kind of options would you see advertisers being able to take advantage of in the stations? Would we see stuff potentially like we see in Montreal, you know, at Beta Ucam where you have, you know, a station buster where they have big um, uh, advertisements and stuff uh, pulling up on the walls and all that or just taking over a whole station to sort of embellish it with their, their product? It, it, you know, it's a possibility and it's something the uh, advertising sales companies are interested in. We started we we asked the permit the permission of uh, the transit commission to open the train with no advertising so that we could make sure that customers eyes were up we're looking at we're learning the new system we're um, seeing the you know the those big safety posters that we put up things like you know stand to one side don't block the doors don't reach down onto the track to pick up your phone the things that we needed to do to introduce um high capacity rail to people of Ottawa those lessons have been learned now so the transit commission asked us to go out to market and see what um, companies would be interested in in proposing so we deal with we don't deal with the advertiser we deal with a, a an outdoor advertising company so they're like a broker they they have the space from us they have the space on billboards walls across the city and they've got an inventory of space they sell and then <clears throat> when the ad agencies that are working for the advertisers are looking for space, they come and they say, all right, we'll take this, 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 and this. So um, we, in effect, in effect, rent the space out to them or let them uh, rent that space for us. And they came back and told us, yeah, they were interested in the, um, the conventional kind of advertising, the car cards up above the windows, the posters in the stations, in the frames that exist. Uh, but they're also interested in um, digital, putting up video screens um, so that they can animate, so that they can change the message without having to send a, 
a staff member out to change a poster. So that would be but reminiscent order... to what we see in Montreal with the, the Metro Vision yeah, displays the big, in, in the stations. Like at, at Berry, you've got that big screen with the with the projector pointing from the other side of the platform or um, or simpler ones like just at bus shelters around Ottawa where, where it's a big LCD screen that um, uh, that um, people on the street can see. So that's one of the things they're interested in doing, but there's a lot of capital investment that they would have to put into it um, because they've, you know, it doesn't take, it, t it takes a lot longer to make your money back on a, a big giant video screen worth of whatever number of thousands of dollars versus, um, you know, a frame where you're putting in paper or vinyl, or vinyl posters. So what they need um, in order to support that is they need a longer term contract. And we um, evaluated that and came to the conclusion and recommended to the Transit Commission that that be done as we get closer to the opening of uh, all the stage two extensions when we'll have 41 stations for people to um, make proposals on rather than just the current, well, 17, but really just uh, really just 13 at the moment during construction. So from the market going from 13 stations going to 41 stations, they'll be able to promote a lot more. So what we're, uh, what we're doing now um, at the direction of the Transit Commission is uh, an extension with our current contractor who does that advertising inside buses, outside buses, to extend that to also do inside trains and inside stations in the in the existing frames or on the, um, you know, where we've done the vinyl stickers on the backs of, of um, cabinets and things. Um, later on, we'll go to a bigger, you know, maybe in three years or so, two and a half years, something like that, we'll go out to market again with a bigger long-term contract um, that might be 10, 15 years in length so that they, the companies who are bidding can um, see whether they want to make a, a proposal for something bigger, put some money into it. Um, and of course, we we'll, we hope that by that time we're back in a, um, you know, better economic environment. There's more money being spent on advertising um, in stations right now, as you can guess, most of the advertising dollars are being spent on, you know, things people consume at home. Facebook ads and TV ads are probably where most companies are advertising right now. But once the world goes back outdoors again, then outdoor advertising and in-station in advertising should become popular again. The uh, improvements that have been made with your social media presence, there's a lot more uh, presence, there's, there's uh, more staff, more responsiveness to people asking questions through social media. Can you talk a little bit about the changes and what the social media team offers at uh, OC Transpo. Sure. This has been evolving since since uh, Line 1 opened. We saw very quickly there was an appetite for um, a little more information, a little uh, than we had originally been um, proposing to publish, and a little more engagement. I think part of that comes from, you know, when you're riding the bus, there's someone to talk to. Or if you've got a question, you can walk to the operator and you can, you can ask the operator the question when you're on the train. Um, apart from the station attendants and special constables, there's not many people you're going to see. The operator's in a cab. Um, we do ask customers not to to uh, distract the operators. So there's less, pla there's fewer places just to get information. So um, we've seen that. People are asking questions not only by calling into the call center, but just by asking questions on Twitter gives, you know, not just us, but any other customers, a, an ability to provide information to them. So we've, we've beefed that up in a couple of ways. The, the main ways are we just by, by getting more staff, working more hours, and uh, we're hiring staff who are you know, we've just, we've set up a separate set of qualifications and hiring people who've got that ability to engage, um, ability to make it conversational and not just transactional, um, who can, um, you know, just think on the fly and, uh, and, and keep a conversation going and, 
you know, the, the people who are doing that job now are, are really good at that. Um, some of them are old hands at OC Transpo and know everything that's going on. Some of them are new to transit. They've come in from, um, other employers and they will be, you know, they need to learn more about, um, OC Transpo, how it works and what our customers are looking for. And, um, we've still got more positions to fill, uh, so that we can extend the hours longer and longer through the, through the evening, early morning and into the weekends. Thank you, Pat, for giving us your insight as to what's coming with OC Transpo and all the changes that are being made and the advancements that are being made to further enhance the customer experience. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Shane. Take care. We'll see you again.